and sing out with me and worship the Lord this morning. There's within my heart a melody. Oh, there's within my heart a melody. And Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How many are here this morning? <laughs> I'm glad of that. How many are not here this morning? All right. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to have all y'all. Amen. Well, welcome to Harbor Baptist Church. It's a pleasure to see you be in the house of the Lord and look forward to a, a good time in the word. Fellowship one with another, and we just trust God to give us a blessing. I appreciate our guests with us here today and returning guests. If you're here for the very first time or you haven't been here in eight years, we would like to meet you in the back. All right. When I say eight years because I was not here eight years ago, I wouldn't have known you. And, uh, and so, nonetheless, uh, I'd love to meet you in the back. We have a gift for you as well, uh, just to say thank you for coming to Harbor Baptist Church this fine uh, Sunday morning. Isn't it just a beautiful day to be in Florida? Hey, Amen. Someone said it's good to be, good to be anywhere. <laughs> you know, and I guess that's the truth too. But uh, we thank the Lord for His goodness. All right. Well, let me pray. Then we're going to read our memory verse. Then we'll have you be seated. Our Father, thank you so much for this day. We're grateful to be together. We pray you bless the proceedings of this service. We certainly want to give you glory in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you see, uh, let's look at our memory verse, please. We'll, we'll read it together. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'll have you just kindly be seated if you will. And I have in our harbor, <clears throat> harbor highlights, we have just a few things to be praying for the Nelson family and their missionaries to Australia. We also uh, look at the around the corner events. And so tonight though, we have our Lord's Supper service at five o'clock. I want to remind you of that as well. Uh, Michael will be preaching a, a lesson on the sacrifice and Passover prior to, and then we'll have and observe the elements uh, following that. And then as we uh, go on, we have the ark trip. So there's about 11 of us that will be gathering together in uh, where the ark landed, I guess. I don't know. I thought it was Ararat, but nonetheless, I guess they found one in Kentucky. And so we're going to go to Kentucky, and uh, a church has been so graciously, uh, has been very gracious to give us one of their vans for the week. And uh, we'll get a chance to see the Bearing Precious Seed um, uh, print shop uh, over in Milford, Ohio, and then back into Kentucky for both the Ark as well as the Creation Museum. And the Creation Museum uh, was, we have uh, comp tickets, I guess, given to us by the church at Milford, so we can get in free for that. And then we'll uh, visit those two items, and then on Friday evening we'll fly home. So my prayer request is to you is to pray for us for safe uh, connections and travel and, and all the things that can 
come together, that it will all stay together. Amen. We have a plan. We want to work the plan, but you know the devil always likes to show his plan every now and again. And so we're just, uh, I just commit us, please, to prayer, if you would. Um, then we have uh, the fifth Sunday saying coming up next Sunday night. So we do have a sign-up uh, sheet there on the back welcome center. So if you would, please, if you'd like to have a song sung or you want to be here and, and sing, that would be a blessing as well if you would just sign up there as we do each thir- uh, fifth Sunday of the, that it falls throughout the calendar year. And it'll be a blessing for us. Moving into May, we have our Daughters of the King ladies meeting. Lots of good planning going on for that. If you ladies would sign up for that. And it'll be a a wonderful time. And uh, men will be actually hosting and bringing the food to you and caring for you while uh, for that dinner. And the program will be right in here. And so, again, pray for that May 6th. And men's prayer breakfast is the 13th. Mother's Day is coming up. We have the, uh, the uh, puffers here for Mother's Day morning. They'll sing a few songs, have a concert Sunday night. And then on Tuesday, we'll have, uh, we'll get right to that one. Uh, Tuesday is Harbor Lights. And so we're going to have them do the concert uh, uh, as they have normally over the years. Uh, at 11, we'll have a lunch prepared uh, afterwards. So I'll have a good time. But with that, because of timing, uh, I had to schedule this at this particular week. And it's a, uh, it's a history of the Bible seminar. It'll be the night services, the 15th, 16th, and 17th. And uh, Pastor Jim Alter from Grace Baptist Church is going to be coming. And he is a, uh, uh, he's just, he knows his stuff when it comes to uh, church history, Baptist history, and the history of the Bible. And so please uh, come to that. I see it's in your, in your uh, around the corner events as well. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing to see, where did we get the Bible that we read? Amen. And so that's a, it's an interesting thing, and I trust that you'll be a part of that as you can. I understand there's a lot going on, but if you come to any one of them, you're going to want to come to all three. So if you come to the first one, <clears throat> we're going to have a meal prior to as well. So that, that, that might reel you in, all right? Uh, so we'll have a meal at about 5.15, a light meal. And then uh, we'll get in about uh, 6 o'clock, and probably about 7.10 we'll be done. Uh, and that'll be on uh, Monday night. Same thing Tuesday and Wednesday. But if you just come Wednesday night, you're going to say, I wish I'd have come Tuesday and Monday, all right? So come try it out on Monday night, all right, if you would. And, uh, and if you're able, uh, it'd be a real blessing. All right, those things to pray about and that we have. We're excited. Again, we're glad to have you today. And uh, Josh, would you come? All right, Higher Ground, 549, if you're following along in the books. going to be, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Upon his promise 
morning we're going to read in our scripture reading uh, Psalm number 23. I think some of you probably have it by memory and so you can roll through that in your mind if you'd like as I read together our scripture uh, to meditate upon and uh, we'll be praying in just a moment. It says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful psalm. I'm sure it's well known, and I trust it'll be a, a good start in this Sunday morning as we pray one for another. Pray for the this, uh, session coming up here, and thank the Lord for our special coming up as well as the message. And uh, let's go ahead and have the music play as we pray. Father, we thank you for the music that plays so sweetly. We thank you, God, for the song that rings in our hearts. And, and Lord, we're reminded of your goodness and your mercies. Father, we thank you that we can 
uh, come before you in prayer. Father, we are grateful that you hear us, that you're here present with us, Father. And we are asking that you would allow thy, thy, thy Holy Spirit to have his free course with our hearts. Father, I pray that all things done uh, today will be to your glory. We just want to magnify the name of Christ. We lift Jesus up today. We look forward to what you'll do with us and in our hearts. And, and Lord, that uh, whatever it is that is done, uh, that we, done, we would do it with uh, uh, surety. And, and Father, that we would do it um, with permanency. And Lord, that we would truly uh, please you in our endeavors. God, thank you again for uh, meeting with us this morning. And we lift your holy name today, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have a special. For so long I searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and my greed Then the door of prison was opened by love For the ransom was paid I am free I'm free from the fear of tomorrow I'm free from the guilt of my past. I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Yes. I am free from the guilt that I carry. From the dull, empty life I'm set free. For when I met Jesus, he made me complete. He forgot the foolish child I used to be. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of my past. I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. I would have to say that Burl Ives sounds a lot like Brother Jim Postma. And I always appreciate uh, Brother Jim's singing, and uh, we thank the Lord for um, God's use of his servants that are willing. Amen. And are there any others willing out there? Be a part. Amen. God will use you in a great way. We thank the Lord for it. All right. Please take your Bible, if you would, in Genesis 39. We'll be in Genesis 39 this morning. We're uh, dealing with uh, our patriarch, uh, Joseph, young Joseph, and um, we left him the last time uh, sold into slavery, all right? And now we're going to look in Genesis 39, and I was contemplating of the Lord how to go about this message. It's often preached with the idea of uh, the indiscretion that would happen, the lie that was there that still did not happen, the temptations and how to get out of temptation, all of those things seems like it's focused on that middle section of Genesis 39. And although that's the truth there, we will read through that as well and make comment, but uh, truly we want to look on the brighter side, all right, on the end caps of that story 
in Genesis 39, and I've entitled the message a number of ways, I guess. It could be a lesson on prosperity or the ingredients of prosperity by Joseph here in Genesis 39. And uh, so if you have your Bible there, look in Genesis 39. If you'll have it there and ready, I will jump to that in just a moment. But let me think, uh, let me think about this here. Um, we have one son that had a birthday here recently, and it uh, seems like every year they have birthdays, you know. I, don't know, I think we all do. And, we, and so we think, what's, what do you get for a birthday? What, what is the typical thing you're going to have for your birthday? Oftentimes it would be a cake or a pie or whatever the case may be. But, and I was thinking about what makes a good cake. And we can sit here this morning and talk about our favorite cakes. It's hard to beat a carrot cake, I'm just saying. But uh, there's a good chocolate mayonnaise cake. How about that, huh? How about a red velvet cake? German chocolate cake. Oh, are we hungry yet? What, what makes it good? What makes it taste good? Well, of course, it's got to be the ingredients. But are the ingredients the whole, the whole deal? What if you mess up the ingredients with wrong proportions? What if you... Of course, you know you've got to put it in the oven at some point, and what if you have it too high or for too long? There's a lot that goes involved when it comes to making a good cake. And so ingredients are terribly important because it doesn't matter how perfectly you bake it with timing in the right pan and, and all that stuff, but if you have horrible ingredients or out of proportion or way too much soda, if you have too much uh, baking soda, or if you have too much salt, whatever the case is, or too much garlic in your cake, that would be really bad. And so um, what, what matters truly is, is a combination of the recipe all put together well. And you're going to come out with a pretty decent cake, I would definitely say. And so I look, as we look at this message this morning, I've put it together kind of like uh, the thought of being prosperous and the idea of baking a cake or a pie. And as we fill in the blanks here, you'll kind of see how, how we work through it. But nonetheless, we have another word in our title that I want to give a little definition to. It's good to understand the words that you read and have an understanding uh, of how it can be used in, in the sentence or in the context and such. And so what does it mean to prosper? What does it mean to, to prosper? I think we can think of something growing, right? We'll think of something with, that is successful. It's maybe somewhat bountiful. Um, uh, in some ways, it's, it's to push forward or to carry forward um, favorably. You have, uh, if you're sailing a sailing boat, you would want prosperous winds, right? That'll carry you the direction because of your sail. You have that prosperity there of the winds that carries you along. It's, it could be something that's thriving and successful to gain or to make increase. That's our thought when it comes to being prosperous, and uh, you can go through the scriptures and find a number of places, and it's a good thing. If you've got a little Strong's Concordance, or if you've got a dictionary, or a, a, or a, a Bible app, or something, that you can plug in a word, and then hit, <laughs> hit send, all right? And, and you'll see that word coming up throughout the scriptures. And then just read through those. Those are just an incredible study, personally. Instead of just reading your Bible daily, take time to study the Word of God. And take maybe some word studies and take a word that might have popped out for you as you're reading through Scripture, as your normal uh, custom would be, and a word might just click. Then take that word and click it into, a, into an app of some sort and let it roll into all the other uses within the Scripture. And it'll bring to light uh, truly the, many, the meaning of that thought. It'll really help you as the Scripture will give light to the Scripture. And that's an, certainly an important thing to do as a student of the Word of God, is to see how it relates in other areas in Scripture. I will not take time this morning to speak of all the, of those other ideas. When it comes to prosper, I'm trusting it's a word that we are totally uh, can, can identify uh, with. So <clears throat> prosper will be a word here that we'll look to, as well as, uh, I want to make a little note of interest as we're reading through the Scripture here. And... As I'm reading a passage and I see something that's repeated over and over again, do you think maybe you ought to pay a little attention to it? That's just how I am. I'm going to look at that and, and think, hmm, I wonder, wonder what's being said here, or is it the way it's being presented in such a way? 
And I, I can't even count the numbers of, uh, uh, numbers of time that that particular phrase is in, the, is in the Holy Writ, all right, is in the scriptures. It came to pass. It came to pass. In our scripture reading here this morning, in all 23 verses, that word, that section of words, it came to pass, is mentioned eight times in 23 verses. It came to pass. And it's not something mystic. It's not something that, boy, we need to get a hold of that doctrine, brother. All right, that's not what I'm saying. But it does bring to mind the fact that there is in process of time an event surely happened. All right, you can use that as a definition or as a thought. Whenever it says it came to pass, you can say in process of time an event surely happened. It came to pass. And as we go through the scripture here, we'll read the things that surely did happen. If you take that same phrase and click it, uh, and click it into that, uh, uh, that app that you might use or some uh, fashion that you can find out how many times it in or the places of scripture it's, it's written, you'll see a number of them. All right, And I'm going to bring one to mind at the close of our message this morning. It came to pass. Things that have surely, surely, definitely happened. Things in life will happen. Do you understand that life happens? And there are some things that are destined to happen. I think we just passed one of them. Uh, was it April 18th, tax day? They say there's two sure, sure things in this world. And what is that, too? <laughs> death and taxes, all right? Now, I think some of us are trying to cheat death a little bit. We're all holding out for the, for the rapture, amen? I'm thinking that'd be a good deal, all right? And there's some of you here that have gotten really, really sick and came back uh, doing really well. You cheated it out already, and you're still hanging on for the rapture, amen? That's a good thing. But it will come to pass, unless the Lord comes back, that we will die, right? It will, it will come to pass. This message will be over. You can count on that, all right? It will come to pass. Let's read in our scriptures this morning a little bit here as we go, dealing with the ingredients of prosperity. We understand that first section here, our title is the preparing of the ingredients, the preparing of the ingredients, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 39, it says in verse number 1, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now, if you remember our lesson from last week, we looked at the story of, of Joseph and the dreamer and how he was just like Jesus Christ. And how it all, his whole story there in, in that previous chapter uh, that we studied, um, it is an incredible picture and parallel of the life of Jesus Christ. And so as we continue here in this chapter, and of course we ended with him going to prepare a place. Remember, it was Joseph was going to go. He's sold into slavery. He's going to a place. <clears throat> and this is truly, now he's at that place. All right, so now it's a whole new picture as we look at it today. And uh, we'll see Joseph here as in the preparing of these ingredients. He is now bought with a price, I guess. We can continue in the thought there. Who else was bought with the price? Amen. We were, all right? We certainly were, and it was. And, and we know that Jesus uh, is the one who was that purchased uh, uh, body, all right? Uh, and because of his gift for us, we then have eternal life because of the cost it was, that pearl of great price, Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, all right? He was a prosperous man. He was, he was, a, uh, he was a, a, a favorably entreated, I guess you could say. He was a thriving, a successful man. He was one that was brought forward there, we would say, uh, in a favorable fashion. He was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So in verse number two, some time has passed. Uh, he didn't walk in as a prosperous man per se, as you look at it and as we're looking at it as far as timing, because this happened throughout the time that, was, that he was there. I like to read verse 2 backwards just a little bit. It says, he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He became prosperous 
And then you can still go backward and says, and the Lord was with him. All right, so what, what's happening here is it is all the Lord that give, makes him and gives him the prosperity. And he is in the house of, of, of Potiphar, the Egyptian, and he certainly was very prosperous while he was there. So how was, let, let's look, think of the, the prosperity that is here. What made him to be so thriving? Sounds like he's, sounds like he's more of a, of a servant or a slave than he is being prosperous. Well, we'll think about that here this morning. Let me finish reading. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put in his hand. Did this happen in the first two weeks of him being there? No. What's, what's amazing to me is a conversation that can be held coming up. And did he already know the Egyptian language? I would dare say he didn't. So he's probably taking the time to understand and communicate. You have a person from a different country being banished by his, all that, he, that would love him, supposedly. There he is as a perfect prey to come into the house of a, of a prominent man. And here he is. He's, he's without a home. He's without, without family. He's without any money. He, he's not of the same heritage. He's a, a Hebrew and will be known as a mocking Hebrew. And here he is in the midst of this, this beautiful home, with the, soon to be a, at the hand of everything because of his prosperity. And yet he's a stranger who speaks not the language, who has no real kin that cares. What an interesting position it would be. And so as process of time would be, as it came to pass, as it says eight times in the scripture, time is passing. And he became very prosperous under this man, the Egyptian, Potiphar. And it says the Lord was with him all that time. He found grace in verse number 4, verse 5, and it came to pass that at the time he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Potiphar here, as the process of time would come, he didn't know anything that was going on with his household. He didn't have to look over and double check and trust but verify. He got to this pleasureful point of saying, you know what? That Joseph is an incredible man. <laughs> that guy is incredible. I mean, the, the, what he does with numbers, what he does with, with uh, working with, with these other slaves and how he commands and, and how he directs and how he runs the household. I mean, I couldn't ask for a better gift than Joseph to fall right into my lap. All that I really care about is this loaf of bread that I'm eating today. Well, I can see that it's baked well and it smells wonderfully. And you put that butter on it. After, I don't mean to get you all hungry here, but he's all he concerned about was merely the bread that he was to eat. I'd say that Joseph had it real good in that regard. <clears throat> so his prosperity, I wrote maybe in your notes there as well, as we think of some of the thoughts in verse numbers 1 through 6, some of the ingredients that were involved in the heart and life of this servant, Joseph. Number one, in your notes, it says he had a changing grace. He had a changing grace. Remember, he was sold. He was a slave. He was then bought, and he was turned into a servant of the house. I thought that was an interesting thought because there was a day that you were sold into sin. There was a day that you were simply a slave to sin. You had no real home that that would care for you. You were banished and on your own 
Because, see, when you stand before God, it doesn't matter what family you're a part of. It doesn't matter what uh, pedigree or lineage that you come from. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You are nothing but a, a, a slave that's bound in your sin, and you'll stand before God. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior that would buy you, you'll be banished to hell forever. Doesn't sound like a good situation. But one that trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior will go from one that is a slave bound in their sin to one who's broken from that is now turned from a slave to a very servant in a prestigious job being able to do things for a wonderful master and have charge of many things as you become faithful and, oh, here's the word, prosperous. So we see in the life of Joseph, he had a changing grace from slave to a servant. That could be you and I. And once you are saved, you go from a slave to a servant of the Most High. And that sounds like a lowly job, but it's the greatest job in the world. It's an incredible job to serve the mighty Savior, Jesus. The other thought would be Joseph's knowledge of the, pre of the Lord's presence. Joseph's knowledge of the Lord's presence in verse 2 says, And the Lord was with Joseph through it all. He recognized and felt the very presence of God. That helps be an ingredient of being prosperous, to be able to thrive, to be able to be successful, to be able to do things in a gaining way. Because you know, wherever you go, the Lord's with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. We understand it being said that way. It says, here, fear not, Isaiah 41.10, fear not, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. This is the almighty God that extends that same blessing to you, dear servant of the Lord. To make you prosperous. You'll do it without, uh, without, uh, <laughs> never without him. But he'll ever be with you. The Bible says he'll be with you even until the end of the world. As we witness for him and we do the job we have for Christ. And so we see the changing grace, the knowledge of jo Joseph's uh, understanding. of the, He knows wherever he goes, the Lord's with him. He felt his presence. Have you ever been in a place at any time where you felt God there with you? Trust you have had those occurrences that we're not so close-minded and, and so busy in our life that we don't recognize the presence of the Lord. I trust when you come to a, the house of God where this is his home, that you're treated in such a way with the brothers and sisters in Christ that are around you, with the preaching and the singing, all the, the fellowship that we can have, you can sing, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And that's the, the desire of all of our hearts. It's a great ingredient to know that Jesus is there, but here it's even better. It goes even more. It says, um, in your notes there, Potiphar's knowledge of the same. It says, and he was prosperous, and he was, it says, verse 2, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of, of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Now, how about that? His master noticed that the Lord was with him. I think we can move fast forward in the future in our Bible stories. There were some enemies of the Israelites that were coming toward Canaan that recognized the very presence of the Lord with those, Egypt, those, uh, those Israelites as they escaped the very hand of the Egyptians. So this is on this bookend of that 400 plus years that they were in slavery. As they're going, as they're going out over here, uh, they recognized, the Canaan recognized the presence and the power of God in the lives of the Israelites going into that, into that um, slavery. It was recognized by those in Egypt, the presence of God in Joseph moving in to that whole long period of time. Isn't God incredible? He was with the Egyptians all, and excuse me, with the Israelites all during that time as well. And he, he, he knew their pain. He knew the, 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 the sounds of their cries all of those years. 
So the prepared ingredients for you and I that's a blessing of the Lord in our prosperity, in our prosperousness, as we move forward in the grace of the Lord, as we are carried on our way and, and being somewhat successful and fruitful in our, in our labors, it's going to be depicted by knowing that we've been changed from grace, uh, 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 had a change in grace from a, a slave to a servant, knowing personally that the Lord is with me and the world around are going to know that you're blessed by the Lord. Do you ever have anyone say that to you? They say, my goodness, <laughs> seems like things just go well for you. It seems like God's on your side. I, I trust that that's been a part of your testimony as well, not to brag on self, but to brag on God because he makes the enemies aware that he's with you. I think there's a verse that says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with you. They recognize that there's something higher and bigger than you that seems to show your blessing. The ingredients there, not only with the Potiphar's knowledge of it, but the, just the prospering of the Lord. It was obvious uh, a hand of God that was in their life, in his life, that allowed people to see that God was all and in all everything that Joseph was doing. <clears throat> it goes on in the latter part of verse 3, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Is it all Joseph? No, ah, he's a willing partner. But it certainly was God himself making him to prosper. That's what we pray for each other. We pray for businesses to prosper. We pray for your Christian life to prosper. We pray for your spirit of victory to, pro to prosper in life. We don't want to come to church with a down face. We want to be, be overrun by the devil all week and you come to church broken in pieces. We would rather have you have prospered that week than rather being run over by the devil, but rather being able to be strengthened and growing through the week to be prospered in such a fashion. There's a promotion of the Lord that goes on as well. Look in verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. Well, we see promotions of the Lord. You can go to Psalm 75, if you like, in verses 6 and 7. It doesn't come from the east. It doesn't come from the west. It comes from the Lord. A, prom a, pro a promotion is coming from the Lord. God is the one who lifts us up. And he sets people down according to the scriptures that are there. So we understand that this is a truly a, a God thing in his promotion. We see, it goes on and we see the blessing of the Lord. And it came to pass in verse 5 that he, he made him overseer in the house and over all that he had. That, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And so the enemy, Potiphar was blessed. He couldn't help but see the prosperity all around him, in the house and out of the house, in the field. And he says it all comes down to one man, Joseph, the blessing of the Lord that came through him. You know, another man where judgment of the Lord came through a servant of the Lord as he was on a ship headed to Tarshish. All right? So you understand people will recognize something's going on. One way or the other, whether it's the curse or, or blessing of the Lord, all right? Well, we see not only that, is he blessed of the Lord there in verse 5 and verse 6. It says, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. What a blessing for Potiphar. And it goes on and says, which is actually relates to the following verses. It says, and Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. What is a trait of character? truly was this ingredient of, of, of his. He was goodly. Yes, he was goodly inside as well as outside. Um, you know, there's, there's something to be said about a good person, a wholesome person, regardless of how they look on the outside. I mean, I'm not much to look at on the outside, all right? I totally understand that. I would hope that some intrinsic goodness of the Lord can work its way out of this skin to other, to other people. But sometimes those who have the greatest skin and the, probably the most beautiful quote to look upon 
yet their inward spirit is repulsive. And there are those types of people that walk all around this world. But Joseph was one of the same inside as well as out. Goodly here speaks of radiance. Uh, he was handsome. He was of good form. So that goodliness there is not only, not only uh, emotional or physical, uh, not only uh, intrinsically inside, but it's also his, his outside, his form, his figure. He was a goodly person. And well-favored had to do with his looks as well. I mean, this guy just walked right out of the J.C. Penney catalog. <clears throat> he was good-looking, but he was good on the inside as well as out. And that played to the favor of Potiphar's wife as we go into the next portion. And so the ingredients are all gathered together. The ingredients are in the right portions. They're prepared perfectly in the bowl, poured into the pan, so to speak. And now we go into the oven as we look into the next section. So verses 7 through 19 is the popping into the oven. From the preparing of the ingredients to the popping in the oven. The ingredients of this cake is, is ready to go. But there's really no good cake when it's gooey. Oh, you might want to touch the, the, the fork or you do the whipping, one of those beaters. I don't know how many are beater lickers here today, amen? All right, and, and so, yeah, you can enjoy that, but I would rather enjoy the finished product. I'd rather have the cake, because my mama told me not to eat the batter, because there's eggs in it, and you're going to get sick. So anyway, I've, I've, I've heeded to that all my life. My kids, I don't know where they jumped off the bandwagon, nonetheless. So we're popping it into the oven. So this prepared cake is now going into the oven at Potiphar's house. Look in verse number 7 with me. It says, and it came to pass, again, surely is going to happen. This, this future event is, is going to make its way, surely, after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. When it cast it, it's looked looked at with a provocative way, with evil intentions. It's not just happened to a glance, but it's, hmm, it's, hmm, look at that GQ guy. Gentleman's quarterly, yeah, QG, I guess I was thinking of it backwards. Anyway, and so look at that guy, this Hebrew man that my husband brought to town. She cast her eyes upon Joseph. Notice it says, and it came to pass. This wasn't second day. Hello, honey. It wasn't second day. The Bible says it came to pass as time came. And we look at the word again. Do you realize that it does happen? Situations in the oven, the heat of temptation, the heat of oppression, the, the heat of, of you, you, you fill in the blank when it comes to a trial in our lives, uh, those trials happen and it's pictured as, a, as going in the oven. And you can picture in your own lives times of travail, times of trial that you have already gone through that yet you still face. You picture that as the ingredients of prosperity in the wholesomeness of, of your life, in the beauty of that batter, so to speak, is now entering into the oven zone. And it's going to be baked with the heat of trial, baked with the heat of temptation. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stretch you to the edge. It's going to find everything out in you. It's going to bring out the, the flavor, so to speak, because of the heat of the oven. This wasn't a good time here for Joseph. None of it was all that good. He was blessed because of God's blessing in the circumstances. I'm sure he'd rather back, be back with dad and the family, but here he is in alone, as alone in, a, in a strange land, learning a new language, getting along with the people, making sure his honor and integrity is intact, and he's serving his master properly that's there. And yet it comes to the test in verse number 7. As as time would go on, the master's wife did cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused. 
Praise the Lord. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not. Now there's a good English word. Wotteth not. It means to not be aware. He knoweth not. My master is not aware of this. He says, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. He's not having spy cameras, making sure and I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. He trusts me. And he doesn't have concern. Remember, he's just concerned about the bread he's eating at the, da at the daily table. He says, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. What an incredible honor. There is none greater in this house than I. You can see where he's risen to. God has promoted him to be right under Potiphar and to care for everything that was there. He says, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Sin against God? How can I do this? See where his mind was? Ultimately, yes, he was thinking, he was thinking initially, sorry, about Potiphar. But ultimately, he was thinking about God. Yes, he's going to offend Potiphar. But he ultimately is worried about his offense against God by his, this great sin. So he kept God foremost when it come to his, his endeavors and this temptation that would come against him, this heat, this oven that was cranked up. And it came to pass, as time would go day by day, she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not. He refused and he hearkened not good words unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Can we say it this way? In any way that seems unseemly. It's not just the act of lying with her, but by doing anything in and around her that would make it look like he had any interest in her at all, in any unseemly way. And it came to pass, in verse 11, about this time that day that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. You know, Joseph was doing what he always does. He, was, had, he had a routine. Do you think maybe that the lady had already arranged for no one to be there? Possibly. Making sure that she could be and set the trap, set the situation that he could not really get out of. But yet he, in his integrity, is still doing the right thing by obeying and doing what his master had, had called, called him to do, as he's the overseer of the house. <clears throat> None of the men were there. Verse number 12, and she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Well, that's that outer robe. Some say it would be sh uh, uh, sleeveless. And, uh, and it would be just a covering. It would be the, the Asian look or the, that, that type of uh, look for those, uh, the, or they called the Orient back there, for their normal garb as an outward wear. <clears throat> so when he had that coat off, it wasn't, didn't make him naked in any way. It was just his outer garment. But it was his, obviously. He was known by that garment. And it says he fled and he got him out. 13 says, and it came to pass, it surely did happen when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. Please understand there was no witnesses there, just exactly what she wanted, making sure no one would, would uh, be a naysayer to whatever she would say. It says that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, see, see, isn't it amazing how just at her own voice the men came running? Yet where were they previously? Interesting. It says, saying, He hath br uh, brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he had heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. Boy, she's, she's stirring the pot. She's making the story look like it's her story, and it truly was her story. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. 
you know, I can just see her taking that coat and stroking the collar of it. <laughs> I got you now. You wouldn't be mine, and now I'm going to make you pay. As he, she carefully cared for that garment that was the instead of him. You know, there is some importance to the crying out idea here. In Deuteronomy, years later in the Israelite law, Deuteronomy 22, it says, Then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried out, she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath stumbled his neighbor's wife, has humbled, excuse me, his neighbor's wife, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. What made the difference here, life or death, for the woman is if she cried out or not. If she didn't cry out, well, then it sounds like she was complicit to it. But that she did cry out, I just thought that was an interesting thought there regarding her, her, her plea, making sure that no one had any, any idea that she was a part of this thing, but rather she was truly the victim of this thing. <clears throat> Verse 17, and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, not Joseph, not good old sweet Joseph, but that Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me, as she says to her husband. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. Yes, honey, that's what that man did to me. Can you imagine? And I have his coat to prove it. And he's out of here. You won't see him anywhere because he's run scared. Well, that's the popping in the oven. All right. I'll finish with 19. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Now, I know Joseph wasn't there. I always thought, why is it that he would, if after all of the prosperity that he's seen, after all that is gone, uh, th these years now, he's been in the house, how is it that she, he could so quickly just bl believe the wife and cast out the servant? That's one of those questions I'm going to ask when I get to heaven. I don't get it. I don't understand other than a husband and a wife and the jealousy and the rage that goes. All right? And there's definitely a part right there. And so he believed his wife, even knowing possibly that she would have cast her eyes, even knowing that she would be that type. I mean, how, how can you be, be and live that way and all of a sudden this just sprang up? Whatever the case, conjecture as we would believe or, or wonder, he believed the wife Send him to prison. All right, so here, the popping in of the oven. Now this, this cake is there. It's continuing to, to, to go. Uh, maybe the heat of the oven has gone down. <clears throat> We're going to see the, the latter part here as we close this morning. We have the popping into the oven. Now the last one is the pleasure of the outcome. The pleasure of the outcome. And Joseph's master took him. Put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now, of course, in my little picture here, I picture the oven open, the cake brought out, and it's set over here on a cooling tray, all right? And that's where the prison would be. He's sitting over here as everyone would walk by and smell that German chocolate cake or the red velvet or you name it, a carrot whatever it would be that's there. Now there he is in prison, out of the oven per se, and he's in another place. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him there. He's in prison. Verse 21, notice it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Does it sound like a deja vu to you? Isn't this exactly where it began with Potiphar? Where in the process of time, he became the leader. 
he became in charge of the situation he was in. Oh, he didn't have freedom. He didn't have the freedom to go back home. But he had control where he was. And this is just what happened again. As the cake is setting out in the warming tray and to, to I get, actually cool off and getting ready to eat, we can see the pleasure of the outcome. How Joseph was at the beginning of the oven, he's only better on the other side of the oven. Because of the great ingredients that he had going into the oven, even through the heat of the oven as he came back out, oh yes, he's in prison, he's there, but look what God does for him there. I put him in your notes. The Lord was present in the oven. The Lord was present out of the oven. The Lord was present before the oven. The Lord continued to show him mercy. God gave him favor, and the Lord made him to prosper again. Incredible story, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, it's a story. It's a horrible lie that's there in the midst of the oven, so to speak. But what God has done from the beginning to the end is an incredible masterpiece. And you and I get to enjoy the cake, amen. Now we've got to dismiss and go eat somewhere. <laughs> the ingredients of prosperity. And it came to pass. I just want to remind us of that very statement, it came to pass, life is going to happen. Evil things shall happen. <clears throat> Difficult times of an experiences will happen, but it's going to make a grand and a beautiful outcome from the other side. We know there's times that Daniel was thrown down in a pit with lions. We know there was three Hebrew children running around in an oven, so to speak, that was cranked up seven times the heat. But who was with those three in the fire? Alike unto the Son of God. It's an amazing thing. That's just how God's operation is. You'll never go through something alone. He's always there. It's our job to make sure the ingredients are right with what we can do humanly possible. When it enters into the oven, just hope for the end because you're going to come out smelling good. God's going to use you in an incredible way. You're going to taste and see that the Lord is good and you'll be the one eating it. It says, and it came to pass. Those words intrigued me too, even in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. It's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. Verse number 22, it says, and it came to pass. The beggar died. You know what comes to pass, ladies and gentlemen? Death. Everyone that's seated here today, if it, the Lord doesn't come back, including myself, it'll say, and it will be said of you, and it came to pass. He or she lived, and it came to pass that he died. Those things we have to take seriously. And I think in our thought here of the idea of an oven and a cake and all that is good, it's goodness, we understand that just as it all came to pass in life, it's all going to come to pass in death. My question for you today is, are you prepared when it comes to pass? If you're going to be here in some service as we memorialize your life, can we say it came to pass that on a certain day, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so trusted Christ? as their Savior. It came to pass on October 6th. It came to pass. Whatever the date was, you know Jesus was your Savior on that day because you trust and you called upon Him as your Savior. It came to pass. You got saved. It came to pass. You came to Harbor Baptist Church. You know, it came to pass. You came here on came here April 23rd of 2023. It was by God's design. You're here. It came to pass. With that greatest coming to pass will yet come, and it's surely going to happen. That's an event that will come in process of time that will surely happen. Are you prepared? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Every head bowed, please, and every eye closed, if you would. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> as we look at the prosperity of Joseph in the midst of the oven, and what's often the story is that midsection. But I wanted our lesson today to be on the bookends of what God can do with us. 
Father, thank you so much for your blessings. It's a pleasure to speak, to preach, to glorify the name of God, to lift the name of Jesus. And Father, we know that it shall come to pass that we're going to stand before God. It shall come to pass that we will die and then the judgment. It shall come to pass there's going to be a, an, an exit that we go north, we go, we go all the way to heaven or we go to hell. Father, there, it shall come to pass. It's the truth. And Father, help us to recognize it and to be prepared. God bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. We'll take a moment to sing this invitation song. If there's any way I, I or we can help you with the matter of your salvation, we'd love to take the time, the Bible, to show you how you can be saved. Recognize that you have a time to pass. Something's going to come. Events come. The oven might be in front of you. Please understand that the Lord's there with you, and we're going to be with you as well because that's what Christians do. We love on one another through this thick and the thin. We won't kick you when you're down. We lift you up, dust you off, and encourage you yet again, just like happened to our subject Joseph today. God bless us as we sing. How can we help? Sing. one in your books sing a song here to dismiss. You know the event's coming up tonight, 5 o'clock, and the others coming on. And we have some folks already headed towards and already in Cincinnati uh, waiting for us on Tuesday um, that are here from church. So uh, just pray for this week to be a blessing, uh, certainly in that regard, but safety and uh, that God will watch over each of us and you here at home. All right? And let's sing together and as we are dismissed, God bless you for coming this morning.